Welcome everyone as we gather together tonight. My name is Stephen Porter and I am uh, freshly arrived from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and my wife Jody and I are assuming roles here at uh, Acadia Divinity College. I will serve as a professor of, uh, assistant professor of evangelism and church innovation as well as directing the Doctor of Ministry program. So for many of you, you've never met me before, so it's a, a real honor and privilege to get to be here tonight and also to introduce tonight's speaker. But before I do that, we have a special presentation by Dean Zacharias. Danny, come on up. Okay, yesterday I promised that I'd be giving something away to uh, one of our alumni for filling in the alumni questionnaire, and I'm making good on my promise. So, <clears throat> I'm uh, thrilled because we have trouble sometimes getting students to fill things out. <laughs> and... Uh, and we had 43 people do it in the last two days. Incredible. And now I've created a number picker. Let me see here. I will hit spin. Oh, it, it will spin too. Wow, okay. Yeah. Oh, that, that's dizzying. Okay. The number is 35 which is, drum roll, a gentleman named Ronald Ford. So Ronald Ford, I don't, I don't know if he's here or he's online, but either way, Ron, you'll be getting, I'm gonna make him come maybe, but so he's gonna get the East Coast Theology hoodie. All right, congrats Ron, and thanks everybody. And we'll be continuing to give prizes for those who go in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, as we resume, tonight, uh, the Simpson Lectures, our third and final installment, uh, will be focusing on a public witness for our time. And I could not be more uh, really grateful uh, than to introduce Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. Um, you've heard him described as an activist, an author, and all of that is true. But I would say, if you've read anything that Jonathan's written, uh, you would know that it is rooted and grounded in the common life he lives together in an intentional Christian community called Root the House. And my wife Jody and I were privileged to be their neighbors uh, for four years. Um, from 2007 to 2011. And so uh, for us, um, arriving in Acadia and being in some sense welcomed uh, by Jonathan and Leah and their children um, is a, an interesting sort of homecoming in some ways to us. Uh, but I think it's really significant that for all the kind of, you know, vaulted words of activist and author, if it were not for his life as a neighbor, I would argue that Jonathan's writings would ring hollow. But because I've seen the way that he embraces strangers to become friends, and even housemates in Root the House, um, the ways he knew our community, our neighborhood, the ways he befriended us when we came to study for a season in the same place, um, I'm persuaded that uh, there's real truth in his writings because of the integrity of his living. And it's not, of course, his living alone, it's his living in community, uh, as a parent, as a friend, as a family member, uh, but especially as a neighbor. Uh, it's a real joy and a privilege uh, to get to spend time with you this week, and I look forward to your words tonight. Thanks. Thank you. And I almost forgot to pray. So I'll pray. Oh, please. With you please, and for please, you. Please, please. Uh, come, Holy Spirit, and speak a word to us that somehow changes us. Amen. Amen. 
Well, it's a treat to be here with you, Stephen and Judy. Do I need to do anything? Oh, there we go. I was saying, it's a treat to be here with you. And uh, I'll say to the community here that uh, it's a real treat that y'all have them in your midst now. So I'm uh, delighted y'all will be getting to know one another and growing in community here. Um, before we get to this third and final lecture, I wanted to start this evening with another song. Do you mind? Uh, I'd like to uh, tell you the story of a song, and I won't tell you all the reasons why until I get to the end of the lecture tonight, but I hope all this will make sense in the end. Uh, but to tell you the story of this song, I'll have to tell you the story of uh, a place in Tennessee, uh, which is connected to uh, a couple named Miles and Zilphia Horton. I don't know if you've ever heard the name, but uh, in the early uh, 30s, Miles and Zilphia Horton went to Tennessee. Um, uh, it was largely because Miles had a vision for starting a popular education center. And this vision had come from his experience in seminary, so it's a good place to be telling this story. He'd gone to seminary in New York City at Union Theological Seminary, but they sent him for his summer internship to a little church in Tennessee. And um, some of you probably had this experience when he showed up for his summer internship at the little church in the rural community in Tennessee. The pastor said to him, glad you're here. You're in charge of VBS. Um, <laughs> So he, uh, you know, threw his energy into welcoming the kids every morning and arranging programming. And Miles said that uh, in the afternoons, when the parents would come by uh, to pick up the kids, he would try to strike up conversations with them. And uh, he found them to be very interesting people. And sometimes they would get to talking about this or that in the community. And he would ask them, well, where do you get together with other people to talk about that? And they said, oh, we really don't have a place to talk about that. And um, this gave him an idea. So he went to his uh, supervising pastor and said, um, if I keep running the VBS, would you give me one night a week when I could invite the parents who are bringing their kids to VBS to come and just have conversations at the church about what's happening in the community? Because some, some of them have you know, concerns about things that are happening, and they'd like to get together and talk about them. And the pastor said, hey, kid, if you've got the energy, do it. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, he gave him the church house one night a week. And that summer, uh, Miles began this experiment in just getting people together with their neighbors to talk about what's happening in their community. And he decided that uh, if you could do that, most people in the place where they are know what they need uh, to do. Uh, he really came to believe in the wisdom of people to address, to know what problems need to be addressed and to address them together. He, he said uh, he thought that people just needed to be resourced uh, to address the problems that they already know the most about. And this was his vision for popular education. So they started the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. And uh, Zilphia, his wife, was the cultural arts organizer for the folk school. So in the 30s, they were doing a lot of labor organizing. There was a lot of labor organizing happening in the South. And uh, black and white folks uh, were, uh, in some cases, working together, which was um, something of a challenge to Jim Crow segregation. Um, but uh, the labor movement, in some places, recognized that when black and white workers stood together, kind of like we were talking about last night with uh, fusion, that they had uh, you know, more power to really press the bosses to pay them more. And so uh, they were supporting a tobacco workers' strike down in South Carolina. And whenever they went to support uh, these movements that were happening in communities, uh, Zilphia took it to be her responsibility to listen for the music that was coming out of the movement. And so um, she heard a woman singing on the picket line in South Carolina, a song that's very familiar in black churches in the South. Uh, but when we sing it on Sunday morning, it's pretty upbeat, and it usually goes something like this. I'll be all right, sweet Jesus, I'll be all right. Oh, yeah, I'll be all right. After a while, after a while, that's the echo. Anyway, you may have heard it before. Uh, if you come south sometime, you can hear it in almost any church. As a matter of fact, at our church in Walltown, uh, it's interesting to see when, when folks choose to sing this song. The Sunday morning after Donald Trump was elected, the male chorus was on, and that was what they led with. <laughs> I'll be all right after a while. <laughs> um, so it's a song of hope uh, that you sing maybe when hope is hard. Uh, but long tradition of this song, and it was striking. I mean, Zilphia Horton had heard this song, but it was striking to her 
that this woman who was standing on the picket line all day long had really slowed it down. And she had changed it a little bit. And she was singing it, we'll be all right. Because they're in this struggle together, right? So she's trying to bring people together. And she's singing this song she knows from church. But she's, she's really dragging it out. We'll be all right. Oh, one day <laughs> we'll be all right after a while. Well, she heard her sing that song all day long, and she took it back to the folk center. And um, uh, when they learned songs from folks in one movement, they would teach it to folks in other movements. And there were people who uh, came through uh, the Highlander Folk School um, and would help spread these songs, uh, folk singers who would, who would share them. And years later, one of their friends was a folk singer named Pete Seeger. You may have heard his stuff. And uh, uh, Pete heard this song, and uh, he and some other folks who were at Highlander sort of uh, uh, changed it a little bit more, and uh, they started playing it on guitar, so it had the guitar rhythm to it. And um, they started singing it in, uh, in the form that you'll probably recognize it. They started singing it, We shall overcome. We shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. So a lot of people came through the Highlander School in the 50s and uh, early 60s who were uh, becoming and would become part of the civil rights movement in the South. And uh, uh, one person who had heard that song at Highlander was a woman named Ella Baker. And Ella Baker helped Martin King organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which did a lot of the organizing work um, of the movement after the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, but in 1960, when uh, young people started sitting in at lunch counters, uh, first in Greensboro and then uh, very rapidly that spring, it spread all across the United States. Um, Ella Baker uh, clipped every news story. She, could, she, she had people send her news stories from local papers all over the country. And uh, she wrote down the names and the colleges of these students who had been arrested, and she invited them all to come and spend their Easter weekend break with her at Shaw University. And um, she told them, y'all have got something going here. You need to make it your own. And they founded an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she invited, uh, by that time, Zilthea Horton had died, but she invited uh, Guy and Candy Carawan, who, were her, who had succeeded her as the cultural arts organizer at Highlander, to teach that song to those students. So you know that song because they taught it to them and they went and sang it <laughs> on the news when uh, uh, often when people were brutalizing them and the song went around the world. It's, um, but it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder that uh, songs that we learn in church can... Uh, uh, lead us into uh, movements that are happening in the world, and in the midst of the movement, they can grow and change and become uh, uh, anthems in new ways. And so, um, and so, thanks for singing along. Um, hopefully, we can sing a little more before we're done here this evening. But uh, I want to turn in this third lecture toward uh, the question of what a Movement for the Common Good can look like today. Uh, if you were here on the first night or if you joined us online, we looked at the danger of white Christian nationalism in, uh, um, in the present and its roots in the past and uh, tried to uh, face uh, a principality in power that frankly is rather disturbing um, and that can feel overwhelming. And I, I promised you that if you would come back that uh, we would uh, spend some time 
looking at, even though this uh, real distortion and corruption of faith has been here for a long time, that there has always been uh, another tradition, a tradition of uh, what we talked about as moral fusion politics, um, that uh, in the very place where uh, the, the uh, white Christian nationalism that we talked about came to be, all along there was uh, this other way of uh, living out faith and working for the common good in a way that was rooted in faith. Um, that was last night. Uh, tonight, what I'd like to uh, talk to you about is uh, how people are putting that into practice today, uh, in particular in uh, the context where I have been and been learning, and uh, then I hope we can talk together about what this might look like uh, at the very local level in terms of uh, your ministries, but also in terms of building connection and building a, 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 a movement for common good um, in society at large. Uh, and so I wanted to begin talking about moral fusion politics today by telling you the story of, um, uh, I don't see Carol Ann tonight, but Carol Ann asked a perceptive question last night, and I should have known when she asked such a perceptive question that she would win the trivia quiz at the very nice party that we had afterwards. So if you missed the party, uh, y'all do it again. The East Coast Kitchen Party was a lot of fun, and Car Carol Ann knew the answers to all the questions. Uh, but she asked a good question before we left here, and her question was, who coined that term, moral fusion politics? And uh, uh, I hadn't told that story in full because I had intended to tell it tonight. So let me tell you a little bit more about my friend and my teacher, uh, Reverend William Barber. Um, uh, I told you on the first night that when I realized that I was uh, uh, going as fast as I could in some ways in the wrong direction, that I had to uh, uh, go and learn uh, this other way. This, uh, and this tradition of moral fusion politics was one that I knew next to nothing about. But uh, when I was 16 years old, I did meet William Barber. He was the uh, pastor of a church in North Carolina at the time called the Greenleaf Christian Church. And um, uh, he uh, graciously recognized this, you know, white boy who had been uh, a little devotee of the religious right as somebody who could at least potentially learn something else. And so he took me under his wing and began to show me another way. And um, uh, some time after that, he became president of the uh, uh, state branches of the North Carolina, of the NAACP in North Carolina, uh, which is a, uh, the oldest anti-racist organization we have in the United States. Um, and um, in that role, he uh, was, was very clear that he wanted to try to revive moral fusion politics. Uh, he knew the history of uh, that in North Carolina, some of which we talked about yesterday, and his father uh, had made it clear to him that that was the real energy at the heart of what people often talk about as a civil rights movement, um, because uh, he, he, he told him, uh, we weren't just fighting for civil rights for black folks, we were fighting to make uh, what we talked about yesterday as the promises of reconstruction real for all people. And um, in some ways, uh, the whole like identity politics, which says, you know, if, if my people are gonna get ours, we have to fight, uh, often makes it look like to other people, well, if you get yours, we're not gonna get ours. And so that kind of pitting of people against one another can, can be reinforced, uh, even by the ways that we talk about history and talk about struggle. And so uh, his, his father had been very, clear with him and his mother too and others in the movement who had nurtured him had had really instilled in him this vision for moral future politics. So what he said when he became president of the North Carolina ACP was um, we're going to build coalition power with all of the people who want justice in this state. So if there are environmental groups that are concerned about uh, the injustices that are being done uh, to destroy the earth um, or to, you know, pollute the water in particular communities. We had a situation in North Carolina where the um, uh, utility that provides electricity for years uh, burned coal and then dumped the coal ash into these ponds that were leaching into well water, and the coal ash was uh, uh, having incredible uh, uh, health impacts on these communities. 
some of them white communities, some of them black majority black communities, but you know, in, in all these places, people were, were suffering health consequences. So whether it was an environmental group or a women's rights organization or a civil rights organization or an organization working for expansion of health care, a um, little bit of a different situation down there in the United States, you know. Um, uh, uh, we also had folks, you know, try to have universal health care in the United States 100 years ago, but we still haven't gotten there. So, there, you know, there's a lot of folks who don't, just don't have access to, to health care, and we have uh, groups that work, you know, to address that injustice. So anyway, whatever the injustice, uh, he spent a lot of time going around the state and talking to people about how, you know, there's something that you care about because it directly impacts you. But he would say, tell me when you go to Raleigh, which is our state capital, when you go to Raleigh, who is it that's resisting what you're asking for? And they'd tell him. And he'd say, well, you know what? They're the same people who are resisting the folks that I met with last night. And they're the same people that resist the NAACP. And those are the same people that resist uh, all, all these other people. And he said, if, if they're uh, cynical enough, to stick together against all of us, we ought to be smart enough to come together and work together and say, you know, we're going to be a coalition that's going to build power and try to change things in the state. And one of the first things that coalition did, uh, we started forming it in 2006, and by 2007, we were able to lobby the state government to expand access to voting. Because if we were going to sort of have uh, this coalition working to uh, you know, to exercise power together, we needed to get people out uh, to vote. One of the problems we have in the United States is that um, uh, we don't have a, uh, great participation in voting in many places, often because people aren't persuaded that their voting could make much of a difference. They haven't seen people who really represent them or their issues. And so uh, we thought it was important to have a campaign that would push for issues that could help people and that would and that would uh, really uh, uh, create a new voting base in the state. And uh, we were able to get that legislation passed. Uh, it's called early voting. Uh, so uh, before, uh, so uh, before, as the system existed, unless you had some extreme circumstance that you wrote to your local election board and got them to mail you a, an absentee ballot, and then you filled out that ballot and got it in by a certain time, the only way you could vote is if you showed up between 7 and 7 on a Tuesday, which for uh, example for low-wage workers can be difficult, right? If you don't set your schedule and you often don't get your schedule until the beginning of the week, um, who knows whether you're going to be able to get there. Uh, you might work, you know, three counties over from where your uh, uh, polling place is. Um, and so we were able to get it passed that um, that people could go and vote uh, for a couple of weeks before election day, and they would, you know, hold the ballots and count them all on election day. And um, this made a big difference in North Carolina politics. In the 2008 election, uh, you may remember that the United States elected its first African-American president. His name was Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama lost North Carolina on election day, that is when they counted the ballots that had been cast on election day, uh, the people who usually voted didn't, didn't elect Barack Obama in North Carolina, but then they counted all the ballots that had been cast the two weeks prior and announced Barack Obama has won North Carolina. <laughs> he, he, he broke the, uh, what, what a lot of political strategists called the Southern, the, the solid South, the South that you know had, had, had really for, uh, four decades plus, you know, uh, uh, stood solidly, quote unquote, red, you know, a reactionary, conservative kind of uh, politics that is often pushed with the narratives that we've talked about earlier this week. Um, something, you know, there was a new electorate. There were people who had hope that something else was possible. And um, that was an encouraging sign that this fusion politics could really um, um, change the conversation about what is possible in public life. Because when we talk about uh, a lot of the things that impact people every day, a lot of it comes down to policies, right? Because policy is just how do we collectively uh, invest what we have in terms of communal resources 
uh, whether it's in education or health care or uh, care for the environment or other you know, c common goods that we share, um, uh, th those kind of real differences in outcomes uh, have a lot to do with the policies that get passed. And you can only pass policies, at least as we have our government set up, if you have a majority of people in the elected legislatures to pass those things and then a governor to sign them. So uh, we, we were very intentionally working to build a moral fusion coalition that could uh, change the balance of power so that we could have different conversations, uh, conversations that really weren't possible with the people who, were, uh, who had been elected then. That was a promising thing. But uh, as this story goes, and we've talked about this historically, in the moments when there's great promise, there's also always a reaction against it. And what we learned at the state level in North Carolina was that the reaction against the possibility of a new electorate and of you know, people who cared about different issues coming together to form uh, a new kind of coalition was that these uh, organizations that we talked about that had really invested in the strategy of using religious nationalism to stir people up with uh, wedge issues, they invested a ton of money in North Carolina. And they came very strong um, using these kind of cultural wedge issues that tell people to be afraid, be afraid of changes that are happening, be afraid of people who are going to uh, uh, threaten your values. And um, uh, they were able, uh, through, through this campaign, to get a lot of people uh, in a reactionary way to show up to vote who hadn't voted before. Um, they registered, I think, some 100,000 new people to vote uh, with these kind of reactionary narratives and putting a lot of money into campaigns. I mean, I'm talking about campaigns that were run with like eight to $10,000 before all of a sudden had a million dollars in them uh, and you know, big staffs working on them and they were able to take control of the state legislature. And uh, by the time they uh, had, had done this and um, were able to control the legislature with a governor in office who would sign uh, the, the bills that they were pushed through, they, um, they took uh, action in uh, the session in 2013 to try to really uh, dismantle the state government as it existed. And they began, I think for obvious reasons, if, if you uh, followed the story thus far, they began by trying to turn back voting rights and access to voting. Um, they, they, they passed a, a bill uh, that would strip away all that early voting, and then in addition to that, would make it more difficult for uh, people with limited resources uh, uh, to vote by making a very restrictive voter ID requirement. Um, uh, arguing uh, uh, without much evidence, really without any evidence, uh, arguing that there was the possibility of voter fraud, they said we need more proof that the people who are voting are the actual people, you know, there. And, and, and by making it uh, um, extremely restrictive on what you could use as proof of your identity, um, they, they tried to narrow down the, the voting pool and to really uh, uh, roll back uh, who could show up to vote on election day. Um, this was our sense, of course, when it was happening, but we, in some, in some ways, know these things to be true and know them to be true in terms of the conversations they had about how they did it, because we sued them. And, uh, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court of the United States agreed that in the language of the federal judge's decision, um, they agreed that the people who had written this law after they looked back and looked at the data they pulled and the conversations they had about what kinds of restrictive ID they would use, they said the people who had written the law had chosen to target African Americans with almost surgical precision. That was the language of the federal judge's decision. And so uh, even a quite conservative Supreme Court upheld this decision that said that that, 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 um, that that voter law was unjust. But that was only one piece. They also, uh, by that time, we were we weren't quite getting to universal health care, but we were going to expand health care to tens of millions of more Americans by expanding our Medicaid program. That was um, something called the Affordable Care Act. And the way it got passed in our U.S. Congress 
the states um, had had to manage it because that's how our Medicaid works. And so the state of North Carolina, this same legislature, refused to accept the federal money in order to bring uh, about half a million North Carolinians onto the uh, health insurance plan. They just said, we don't want the money. Um, they refused to accept, uh, this one was, was really out there and got a lot of people stirred up. They refused to accept um, unemployment insurance payments from the federal government uh, because they said that um, uh, if people had unemployment insurance, they weren't going to go look for another job. So uh, they were just going to stop pa paying those payments. And, uh, and, and then they figured people would go and, you know, get jobs. Um, so they refuse. So I mean, this isn't this is in in the language of the United States. People sometimes talk about these as quote unquote entitlement programs. I don't like that language, but most people don't even think of insurance as. I mean, insurance is something you've paid for. <laughs> you're, you're you're just receiving uh, something that you've paid into. But at any rate, our state refused that. So there was one after another of pretty radical decisions that happened in the state that summer, and. Reverend Barber, who has reflected a great deal on moral fusion politics and how it can change the conversation in public life, recognized that this was an opportunity to bring together a broader coalition that wasn't going to just be about you know, a political party or even just about these advocacy organizations that had been part of our coalition, but that could really be a, a broad coalition of people who were impacted by these decisions. And so uh, he called some together a sort of small group at first of folks who represented different groups that were being alienated by these decisions and said, we need to go and we need to make the moral case that this is wrong to our legislators. Um, when you make a moral argument, especially in public life, it's good to talk about it in terms that we share. And so, uh, you know, in addition to being a a person of faith, into talking about why he does things from his own place of faith. He, he also reads our state constitution pretty closely. And one of the things our state constitution, who I told you last night, J.W. Hood was part of writing, one of the things our state constitution says, right up in the beginning, is that um, uh, the citizens of the state have a right to instruct their legislators on matters that concern them. And so uh, he said that uh, it, it was not only our right, but our responsibility to show up and instruct the legislators. And if they didn't want to listen, well, um, you still have a right to instruct and maybe even a duty. So um, uh, when they closed the door of the uh, hall where they were making the decisions, they just stood outside and kept instructing. And when the people came and told them to stop instructing, they just kept instructing. And so the police came and they arrested them. And the news the next day said that uh, uh, the uh, police at the Capitol had arrested these preachers and leaders of organizations and others uh, for instructing their legislators about how the decisions they were making were hurting people. And folks got fired up. And they said, when are we going back? And it had started on a Monday, so they said, well, we'll go back next Monday. And um, a movement, sort of without being entirely planned, uh, a movement erupted that summer. And for uh, 14 consecutive weeks, of what we started calling Moral Mondays, uh, people kept showing up. And every week there were more people who were willing to go and instruct their legislators and uh, risk being arrested. And uh, when they got arrested, they put them in buses and they'd, they'd take the bus out the basement of the state house and there was a big crowd out there that started chanting, uh, uh, you're gonna need another bus cause baby, there are more of us. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the summer, 1,200 people had been arrested for an act of conscience, right? An effort to, uh, to articulate publicly that what was happening wasn't simply, uh, you know, contrary to what their party thought or their kind of political ideology, but that it was a moral issue and that they were willing to sort of put their bodies on the line and have some skin in the game because they wanted more people to think about it. And it turns out more people did. Uh, at the beginning of that summer, we have a polling firm in North Carolina that later told us that at the beginning of that summer, 
the governor of the state who was signing all of this legislation, a man who had actually run saying that he was a moderate. Um, he had been the mayor of the biggest city in the state. And he, he, but he was going along with this legislature and he was signing everything. At the beginning of the summer, he polled at 64% favorability. And by the end of 14 weeks of people showing up every week, standing outside this legislature in front of thousands of people and saying, look, this is how the decision they made last week is going to hurt me. This is how it's going to hurt somebody I know. This is how it's going to hurt people in my congregation. This is how it's going to hurt my neighbor, my mama. People told their stories and the stories of people they know. And then, in a sort of liturgical act, the crowd would part, and there would be an aisle, and there'd be a little altar call. <laughs> and people would march forward down that aisle and right into the building, and they would carry the instructions right inside. And, uh, well, like I said, a, th a thousand people ended up going to jail. And in all of that, there was, a, there was a kind of public witness that gave us um, a vision of what moral fusion politics can look like today in response to the particular uh, uh, challenges that, uh, you know, some of which we've been talking about this week. Um, other people in other states recognize that uh, because of the way our political system works in the United States and because of the way some of the organizing has been done, uh, particularly by reactionary forces over the last several decades, uh, power in state houses is somehow more, in, in some ways, more influential than any other power uh, because our state houses um, have a lot to do with... Uh, uh, defining who even represents those states in Washington, D.C. Um, I won't explain all of that to you now, but it, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a way of saying that a lot of the power rests in the states and in the uh, state legislatures and their capacity to uh, uh, shape legislation that, that actually influences both state and federal policy. So uh, what, when that movement began to... Uh, uh, get attention and show people that a fusion coalition could come together in uh, a state and, and, and could change what people perceived about what was happening in the state houses, we began to hear from uh, other states, places uh, around the country that also wanted to uh, build these kinds of coalitions. And so today, uh, we have in the United States what we call uh, a poor people's campaign it's a revival of the kind of fusion organizing that um, Dr. Martin Luther King and many others in the civil rights movement and in the uh, uh, peace movement and women's rights movement and environmental movement of the uh, uh, late 60s uh, were coming together to try to, to say that um, uh, all poor and marginalized people are impacted by injustice and we need to build a broad coalition of people who, who are impacted uh, in order to uh, um, change not just you know, who represents a particular district or who represents the people in the, the, the legislative halls of power, but to change what the conversation is about, right? To change the conversation about what's possible. I think that's what movements have done in the past and what movements can do. And so there has been this uh, uh, spreading of uh, the moral movement over the last decade in, in the states. And so what I wanted to share with you is uh, briefly three things that uh, I've learned as uh, I've observed this that I think can apply in other contexts too, and then we can, we can talk about what this might mean. The first um, I think about in terms of the, the way that unlikely friendships make new imagination possible. I think this is important. It's something I learned when I came to Durham from one of my neighbors there. Uh, the, um, the best organizer in, in Durham, North Carolina, when I got there was a woman named Ann Atwater. And um, Ann had become an organizer because she was living in a dilapidated rental unit, uh, a single mother with two girls in the late 60s, uh, when somebody came around knocking on the doors asking if, um, if, 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 if people wanted to get involved in organizing. Uh, and trying to, you know, change just housing conditions in that neighborhood. And, uh, you know, she had to get to work every day, and she had to take care of these kids, and she wasn't 
too much interested in it, but this guy that knocked on her door said, uh, if you come to this organizing meeting tonight, I'll pay your rent this month. And she said, okay, I'll be there. And uh, uh, when she got there, she listened a little bit, and then she started talking, and the, the, the people realized this, this woman was a good talker. And she was also, she could read people. And um, so they sent her to a 17-week uh, uh, community action training, and um, she told me later, uh, after I got out of that and had some tools, I was kicking butt and taking names for the rest of my life. Um, she went and she organized her community and community by community in Durham uh, um, a, a year and a half after she came out of that um, uh, community action training. She was listed in McCall's magazine, which was the big women's magazine in the United States at the time, as uh, one of the women changing America right beside, I still have a copy of the magazine, she, it's Ann Atwater's number one, and then at the bottom of the list is Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> so these were women changing America in like 1969 or something. But anyway, um, uh, she was the most well-known and most militant black activist in Durham in the early 1970s when they finally came to desegregate the schools in Durham. Uh, this was about 1972. Uh, the Supreme Court had said in 1954 that uh, all schools were supposed to desegregate with all deliberate speed was the language they used. And uh, there's nothing Southerners hate more than being asked to hurry up. Um, <laughs> so there had been a long pause and resistance against um, against that, but um, eventually the federal government did send people in, and the guy they sent to Durham, uh, Bill Riddick was his name, he was clever, Bill said, the only way you're going to get the whole community together to talk about something like this is to get the polar opposites to co-lead it, right? Uh, so he wanted Ann to co-lead this process with the guy who led the Ku Klux Klan, and so then he had to figure out, well, how do you, how do you convince two people like that to work together? And um, Bill said uh, he got their phone numbers and he called them up. And he said, uh, this is what I want you to do. I want you to co-lead this process with, and he you know, said the other one's name. And both of them said, oh, I'd never do that. And he said, well, that's okay. I'll just let them do it. And they both said, okay, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> so, he, so he got them in the same office. And they had to run this meeting together. And this poor black woman who was an incredible organizer, and this poor white man who later told her and many of us that he had joined the Klan because it was the only organization that had ever shown him any respect. They listened to one another long enough to realize that their kids actually had a lot in common because they were talking about how to desegregate the schools. And they finally looked at one another one day and said, well, shoot, these schools aren't working for any of our kids. And they decided, we need to work together to just have schools that work for kids. And if, uh, you know, race is getting in the way of that, then actually, uh, C.P. Ellis said at the end of the meeting, um, he stood up in front of the town. And these are people who knew him as the leader of the Klan, and he pulled his Klan card out of his wallet. He carried it around in his wallet. And this was like... This man's sense of identity this is what told him who he was. And he said, if this is going to get in the way of my kids getting a good education, I'm done with it. And he ripped up his playing card in front of the town. And, um, you know, more than two decades later, when I got to Durham, these two friends, they really did become friends, were still working together and taught me that when you take the time to pause and listen and lean into an unlikely friendship, you know, across these lines of division. There's all kinds of lines of division. Race is just one of them. It's all, there's all kinds of lines that say, my kind of people are over here and your kind of people are over there. But often those lines are used to separate us from people with whom we actually have a lot in common. And when we can listen to one another and at least be open to the possibility of unlikely friendship, new possibilities uh, can be imagined. I think that's the heart of the fusion part of moral fusion, right? That 
that fusion is about bringing people together who aren't supposed to be together. I think this is fundamentally what Jesus was about. Have you ever reflected on the kind of people Jesus recruited to be part of his team? The disciples, we call them. You know, he's got a zealot. I don't know exactly what the agencies are called in Canada, but uh, in the United States, a zealot would be on what we call the terrorist watch list, right? Our uh, Homeland Security office would be watching this person. But he also calls Matthew, who's the tax collector. He works for the feds, right? So you got somebody who works for the feds and somebody who's on the terrorist watch list, and you put them together and you say, I think if we learn to live this way together, we could change the world. I mean, that's, to me, that's fusion politics in the heart of the gospel. I learned that from Anne. She practiced it and um, uh, really believed that it was, about, it was about who you are. It changes who you are. She said, to, you know, she, she knew I came from a very different place than she came from. <laughs> but she said, we're going to work together. And if we're, if we're going to work together, you're going to be part of my family. So uh, I'm going to be grandma to your children. I told you all, very, very glad to tell you all the other day that my son, my youngest son, is named Crosby after the Nova Scotian Crosbys. That, you know, we're part of this Crosby clan up here. So we're, 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 we're glad to have that. But, uh, but we're also part of Grandma Ann's family. So some of you have met my daughter, Nora. Nora is Nora Ann, named after her Grandma Ann. Um, she made us part of her family. That's what it meant to her to have fusion friendships, to have, you know, to, to, to say that th this is about who we are. It changes who we are. And I think it changes the, the imagination for what's possible. So that's the fusion piece of moral fusion politics. But I think the moral piece is equally important. Um, in this whole journey we were on with Moral Mondays, we were, we were, we were trying to make the the case that these things were not just about you know, sort of liberal versus conservative or left versus right. They were really about fundamental moral issues. Like, what do you believe is right? Maybe we disagree on exactly how we get there, but let's talk about what's right. It can't be right to deny people access to health care when we have enough resources. In fact, the federal government is offering us resources to provide health care, at least to these particular people. So, so a moral conversation. But at about the same time that we were uh, experiencing this in North Carolina in 2013, uh, across the country on the other side of the United States in uh, the SeaTac community, which is the community between Seattle and Tacoma, Washington, where the airport is. The airport is called SeaTac, and they actually call the community around it SeaTac, too. Um, in the SeaTac community, uh, there was a movement starting that, that is now called the Fight for 15. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's a living wage movement in uh, North America. And uh, one of the fascinating things about how um, those workers, low-wage workers, came together to fight for a living wage um, was not just about wages, but also about just working conditions. And at the SeaTac airport, at a rental car company, there were a lot of um, Muslim folks who worked for the... Uh, uh, rental car company, and there was nowhere for them to say their prayers during the day. And so they just went to the, you know, folks in charge and said, you know, we, we'd like to have a place to pray. And um, there was a lot of resistance to that and pushback. And so they went to their imams to talk about it. And their imams were kind of savvy. They said, this is a religious freedom issue, but it's probably not going to go well for us or for the members of our mosque if we go out and try to make this a religious freedom issue on our own. So these imams called up the Christian pastors and the Jewish rabbis in the area and said, you know, y'all believe in religious freedom too. Would you come with us? And uh, they said yes. And so uh, imams and rabbis and pastors together uh, made a sort of public appeal for folks in these rental car agencies to be able to have a place to pray in their religious tradition. And in doing that, they also said, we'll stand with these workers in their fight for a living wage. Because that's also a moral issue. And uh, about that time, there were also some workers in New York City who were making the same appeal, and they, they connected. And we had uh, what's now also a decade-long struggle for a living wage in the United States. And all along, the worker, because of this experience they had, and because they saw 
that having religious leaders show up with workers made a difference in terms of how the public responded to their plea. They said it's important to make issues that are moral issues, not just about you know, what the workers need versus what the corporation needs. Because that's always going to be you know, a negotiation of who can give this and who can take that. You know, the, the, there are some practical matters there for sure, but there's also a big power differential there, <laughs> right? And, and, and I think part of, the, um, part of the role that moral fusion movements have is to say that, that these moral issues are things that people who are not even directly impacted by them have some concern about, right? Just because of the kind of people we want to be, just because of the kind of society that we want to live in. And that, I think, is uh, an important part uh, of what it means to build the moral side of moral fusion movements. But the final piece that I would take away from this that brings us back to the song is that I think um, in these movements, I've been impressed by the way that uh, people who live within the tradition of moral fusion organizing have to lean on the past while also being creative in the face of present challenges. And I think the, the way that songs work in these movements are just an example of that, right? You, you heard the story of one song at the beginning tonight, a song that's a church song that expresses something that's you know a, a deep conviction of our faith, that we're going to be all right, not because of the circumstances, or not even because of, uh, you know, what we know is going to happen at some time in the future, uh, but because we have trusted one who has told us we're going to be all right after a while. So it's a statement of faith. It's a song of faith. And it's a faith that, you know, it calls people to be engaged in the world and that sustains people in their work in the world. Um, but it's also uh, one that has to face, you know, the particular challenges in front of us. So a labor movement changes the song. And then the civil rights movement changes it a little bit more. And the, 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 the movements can, uh, can bring people to uh, almost like jazz musicians, you know, to be improvisational. You got to know the basics of the song. You got to know the basics of the tradition. But the improvisation is all about how you speak to the particular moment in that tradition and in that vein. And uh, it's been... To me, it's been beautiful to see how uh, songs express that. One that happened with the Moral Mondays movement was a song that comes right out of the church, um, uh, the song Wade in the Water. Have you heard that song before? Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Of course, it's a song about a Bible story. Maybe more than one Bible story, right? It invites you to remember. When have we waded in the water? Well, when Moses led God's people down to the Red Sea and, 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 and there was no way to cross, God said, wade in the water, and the waters parted. And then they come to the river going into the promised land, and they wade into the water. And then, you know, we've got the whole tradition of baptism. What happens? We wade into the water. Well, all that's sort of there. There's a lot of storytelling in that song. But it also happened that people who knew that song and, had, and who shared that faith were part of that movement in North Carolina that summer. And, um, and it also was raining a lot. We would gather outside, and we would get rained on like we got rained on tonight. And so, uh, and so this great song leader, a woman named Mary Williams, who was out there with us, she, she, she started singing Wade in the Water <laughs> because, because uh, you know, we're here for a purpose, but we're getting wet. <laughs> and so it's, she's, she, she's calling on stories that we share in our faith tradition, many of us, but she's also speaking to something that's happening right in front of us. And, and, and then, as, as is often the case, she started playing with the words. She started playing with the words. The, the kind of call and response of this movement had become forward together because we were trying to build a big coalition, right? And we were trying to say we're, we're moving forward. We're not going to go backwards. We're refusing this sort of regressive uh, attack on our state. So we, somebody from up front would say forward together, 
and the crowd would say, not one step back, right? Movements need slogans, need sort of summary statements. So she wove that right into the song. Forward together, not one step back. God's going to trouble the water. I said, forward together, not one step back. God's going to trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. And whenever I talk to pastors, I just think there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from that practice, right? Because you're people who know a story, and you know lots of ways of telling the story and remembering the story in summary statements, in songs, in scripture, in, in, in you know, the sermons that you've preached. We, pastors are storytellers. But if nothing else, I think moral fusion movements can teach us that we, we have to be improvisational storytellers. We have to come right up to the challenge of the issues that are facing our communities, that are facing our society, that we may not have any clue how we're going to get through them, whether it's a Red Sea or a river or a, a Christian nationalist movement or the injustice of a particular thing that's impacting your community, whatever it is, there's this obstacle there. And I think this tradition teaches us to practice a kind of creative innovation and improvisation in the tradition of the storytelling that we know, but open to the new thing that can be possible when we're right there facing the challenge in front of us. So moral fusion politics with a bit of uh, uh, jazz improvisation is what I've been learning as I've been paying attention to these faith-rooted movements that are also uh, um, movements that include a lot of other people who are of other faiths and not of any faith, but who nevertheless share a concern for the common good. And um, I'd love to conclude our time together by talking with you a little bit about how you imagine that might uh, inform your own work in ministry, in your congregation, and... Um, in Canadian society. So let me open it up to you. And thank you for singing, because singing together, uh, I think, is important in all that we do. There's a great song leader from the uh, mid 20th century in the United States. She, she led songs during the Civil Rights Movement. Her name is Bernice Johnson Regan. And Bernice says, whenever we get together, we have to sing. Because of the point of the song is to get to the singing, and the point of the singing is to make us into a community. So it's always a joy to get to sing together. Thank you for singing some of my songs. I'd love to sing some of yours sometimes, so you can teach me. But I'll, I'll, I'll open this up. I'll hand the mic to Stephen, and we can uh, have a conversation together. Thank you, Jonathan. So as Jonathan gets a drink of water, uh, I'm interested in questions you all might have, and we'll start right up front. And it doesn't have to be a question. No. It could be a song. It could be a song, or it could be your own reflection oh, oh. on all this. <laughs> uh, it's a question, and it's not a song. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, That's all right. You talk about the unlikely friendship, mm -hmm. and uh, I, there's a question in my mind when I heard it is, how do we foster that? How do we intentional? It can faith community be part of it? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing I learned from Anne was that um, uh, we we talked a good bit, particularly at the end of her life. Um, I we, we became very close, and I walked with her to, to to the end of her life, and you know she had a. She had a lot to process all the way to the end. Um, one of the things that she wanted to make sure about in terms of getting right with God is she wanted to make sure that she had dealt with all of her anger. 
And so she told me quite honestly, I wanted to kill that man. And I tried a couple times. She had reason, good reason to, you know. Um, and I, she told him this too, and he wanted to kill her. Um, and um, I don't know for sure, but I, I think he may have killed a few people. I, I'm, I'm just saying, like this, the, these were, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to say that uh, I think we should pay attention to where relational tensions are real. Because Christians can, uh, I think, deceive ourselves sometimes into thinking that um, the most godly thing to do is to just be nice. And one thing about sort of trying to be nice in polite culture is that you pretend that no one is your enemy. But as a matter of fact, uh, we do make enemies. And... Uh, you know, there are people who get really mad at you, even if they don't want to kill you. There are people who get really mad at you. And um, I think it's worth paying attention to who gets really mad at you or who gets really mad at your congregation. Are there people in your town who would be glad if your congregation wasn't there? Those would be very interesting people to befriend. I'm not saying that that's the easy thing, but um, the tension is usually created by at least a perception that two parties are at odds with one another. And I think uh, I learned from Anne and others that sometimes we need to lean into those tensions to understand them. I don't have the capacity to overcome all of these tensions. Um, but surprising things happen. I'll tell you this story. Since Stephen brought up our neighborhood where he lived with us. Uh, for years, I lived in this neighborhood um, with a woman who I was quite aware did not want me to be there. She made this obvious. And, you know, I've got enough just good, polite, white culture in me that I tried for a while to just smile and say, hey, good to see you, Miss Hooker, and this sort of thing. Um, until finally one day... I just said, why don't you like me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we sort of had an argument about it because she didn't want to say that she didn't like me. And I said, well, you make it clear you don't like me. Why get, and I, it's, it's not you. It's, you know, so we went back and forth. Um, but about that time um, when we had that conversation, uh, Leah was pregnant with our daughter. And I still don't understand this, but when our daughter was born, for some reason, uh, Miss Hooker fell in love with her. She just loved her. I don't know why. And because she loved her, she started at least being nice to me. And uh, she has crossed on over to Glory now. She's no longer in the neighborhood. But um, but she, you know she was she was a member of our church, and um, uh, I certainly consider myself in communion with her as a part of the communion of the saints. And um, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't think there's anything I could have done to have made that relationship better, but it did get a lot better. And um, I think it's worth leaning into those relationships and trying to figure out where the tension is. You know, you know. Thank you for asking. Yeah, good. I'm conscious of you know, Jesus going to eat with Zacchaeus, right? Not a popular fellow. Yeah, I'm coming to your house today yeah. for dinner. Get ready. Yeah. Yeah, just talking about uh, unlikely friendships. I was, uh, I was working, uh, I, I grew up kind of a middle class uh, evangelical kid, and I was working in the inner city uh, thinking I was <laughs> doing good. And, uh, and, uh, I was working, one, just down the street was a federal halfway house. Now, federal halfway houses are the places that guys who are being released have to, have to go there. Like the, the other communities might protest, we don't want that guy uh -huh. in our community, but they have to go to one that's federally run. Mm -hmm. So we would see people there with real reputations. Mm -hmm. And one of them uh, 
said to me, I want to help you. And I didn't know quite how, to, how he was going to help me, and he didn't know. Hmm. Uh, but as I prayed, I thought, I'm going to take him up on this. Hmm. Just even if it blows up, hmm. it seems like it's an experiment worth uh -huh. a pursuing. And he'd been doing life on the installment plan. He'd done 25 years over, over yeah. time. And what he wanted from me, I found out later, he wanted to learn how to be a citizen. Hmm. Not just a citizen of Canada, but a citizen of the kingdom. Hmm. And uh, he thought, well, I'm going to just immerse myself. Like, that's how you learn a language. That's how I'm going to learn how to be a citizen. Because hmm. he, he didn't have it. So I was going to be his school. Hmm. I didn't know that. And, and I, how he was going to help me. But he introduced me to all sorts of things and hmm. introduced me to the uh, world of 12 steps and hmm. the world of addictions because that's where, that's the pool he swam in. Mm -hmm. And it affected, it affected my life. And then I became, I was uh, 65 and he said, are you going to retire or are you going to, you know, and he really challenged me, you know, hmm. are you going to, and I said, well, I think I've got one more thing in me. He said, well, let's do this together. And hmm. so now we operate a, transitional housing for people coming out of addictions. But I, I couldn't have imagined hmm. being there mm -hmm. 16 years ago when I met this guy. And he's got a, a life now, uh, being, a, being a great dad to his, hmm. to his two boys and, hmm. and being really productive. But it was an unlikely, yeah. unlikely friendship. Uh, uh, apart from the Holy Spirit, I don't know how, how that could have happened. But it's, it's been wonderful and he's a great pal thank you thanks for sharing that story yeah others back here in the center. I gave you a letter there I don't I don't know if you gave you a chance to read it I haven't had a chance yet but I have it in my <laughs> pocket yes <laughs> it's a friend from a friend in California who disagrees with you but <laughs> So, uh, well, good. Let's lean into his disagreement. It's <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I think he's maybe reading uh, D John, James Dobson's uh, writings, mm -hmm. which I see in the emails all the time. Yeah. Who is uh, generating fear about the uh, Democrats and their yeah. and their all their li liberalism and having the the uh, rainbow flag flying on the Capitol and yeah. and it's going to be the end of the freedom of religion and so. Uh, I just thought I'd ask you what you think of, think of that. Yeah, no, I, uh, I am uh, in long-term relationship with lots of people who uh, believe the narrative that I've described to you. Um, this would be, you know, one example of the cultural wedge issues that we talked about, like these, in, these, these. Uh, disagreements that are kind of, if not entirely manufactured, at least really blown up uh, for the sake of um, uh, driving people toward a particular political um, coalition. Um, you know, a big one uh, for the last decade or more in the United States has been uh, around sexuality. This uh, this is where this coalition turned its energies after they uh, decided that they couldn't scare people anymore around their pro-life narrative. So the pro-life narrative was created in order to, uh, uh, there's a longer story here, but I'll try to say it in a summary form, that I really do believe it was fundamentally created to try to channel racial fear without using racist language. Um, and so uh, it did that, and it did it well for quite some time uh, in terms of, it did it well in terms of their purposes, it, it served their purposes, um, but it has had its limits. And so the, the movement has generated other narratives. And um, uh, I didn't tell you this part of the story, but in North Carolina, uh, that, that governor who called himself a moderate, who was signing all of this extreme legislation when we had Moral Mondays in North Carolina. 
he had come into office on a campaign that was supported by uh, a parallel campaign that was run by Christian nationalists in our state that was uh, all about um, uh, trying to scare people around uh, gay marriage issues. Um, so uh, the language was very much like what you just quoted from, from uh, Dobson and others, that, that if the state of North Carolina allowed you know, uh, same-sex unions or, or same-sex marriages in the state, that this was going to uh, mean the end of Christians having the freedom to uh, practice marriage, teach you know, their values about marriage to their children, uh, other things. It's usually the way they say it. And so, um, and so the, um, the fear piece of it is to say to Christian communities that your uh, queer or gay neighbors are a threat to you, and not just a threat to you, but a threat to your religion. They're a threat to your freedom to practice your religion. Um, and um, that has been an effective political strategy in terms of exciting a base of people to turn out for a particular political end. And because it has been effective, the people who do it have continued to do it. But what I was trying to do the first night here in terms of uh, talking about the, the, the very uh, congregational and personal spiritual impacts of the, these communities is that that kind of fear based um, almost redefinition of people's values has had dire consequences in our communities. And if you've pastored in these communities, if you've lived in these communities, if you know these people, uh, you know that you can't stir up that kind of fear without also creating suspicion among people, right? So, so anytime you say, you know, it's us against them, people always start to look and say, are you one of them? Are you one of them? What if my kid's one of them? What if I'm one of them, right? Um, and I think that has been disastrous for the spiritual development of people who've lived in this world and for communities. Um, I'll tell you about the Southern Baptist community I grew up in, because I grew up with a guy named Wade. And Wade was gay. Everybody knew Wade was gay. It's just who he was. He didn't like girls. Like the other guys, that we grew up together. You know, this is just very sort of practically. Uh, uh. But when I was growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, everybody in that church loved Wade as much as they loved me because everybody knew us and our parents and wanted to see us do well. And so he was a beloved child of the church. And when these folks came along and created this narrative, after we were all grown, and we had all gone somewhere else. I, you know, I've only gone back to that church occasionally to do funerals or, you know, visit with people. I think the same for Wade. You know, it's not like any of us were still living in the community. But a pastor came along who found out that this guy's name was still on the roll and had this church vote this guy out of membership in the church because, you know, and again, everybody there knows him. His mom and daddy are there. His aunts and uncles are there. His cousins are there, you know? I think about what, what that does to a community. And all, in my view, all of that, not because of what we read in the Bible, because they're still reading the same King James Version of the Bible that they were reading every year I was there growing up. Me and Wade both in the same Sunday school class, same Sunday school teachers. I bet those women are still teaching the ones who were living. So they're all still there. The Bible didn't change. But that preacher had been convinced by a political movement that this was the most important thing he could do to shepherd that congregation. I think that's disastrous for congregations. And I think it's disastrous for people who, who carry this within them with this sense of guilt and shame that maybe they're not pure enough in their judgments of other people or of themselves. So, again, 
I understand people disagree with me about this, and I've talked to people about it. I don't think I'm going to convince a lot of people, you know, I'm not going to stop loving them. I'm related to some of them. You know, we're going to continue in this life together. And, you know, in the church, um, you know, if, 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 you're in my, if you're in my congregation or if you're in a congregation that I'm serving in any way, God's called me to serve you, whether you've been caught up in this political movement or not. I'm not going to give up on people, but I say, I say all this to say that I, I think this movement has been disastrous for the souls of individuals and for congregations, and that's why I do everything I can to push back against the movement. Uh, I don't hate anybody, and anybody who buys into it, you know, I'll, I'll have a conversation with them about it. And I, and I get it. I get it that people have very different perspectives in terms of what they think is right or good in any particular relationship. Okay. You know, but we, we all disagree on lots of other things too. We don't like tear churches apart over it or, or decide that, uh, you know, people need to be eternally condemned. So um, that would be my response to my sisters and brothers in the Christian family who have been targeted by this political movement and have believed the story that they've been told. And, I, and again, I said this the other night, I'm not saying that these people are ignorant or stupid. You know, I think that's condescending. I think some people genuinely believe this stuff. And uh, people have a right to believe what they believe. But I try to explain my disagreement with it and the reasons why I think it's harmful. Um, and uh, when people don't agree with me, well, I try to go on loving them anyway because I reckon that's what Jesus asked us to do. And I hope that people will at least tolerate me, even if they can't love me. <laughs> We're going to uh, transition to a couple of questions that we fielded from online, and Danny's going to pose. And I'll say, I have heard the political times have changed a little bit, but I've heard uh, Jonathan talk about being an evangelical Christian. And I've also heard him speak in what would be considered uh, churches uh, that wore on their shirt sleeve kind of social justice liberalism. And, uh, and I've heard him talk about Jesus and the people that taught him to love Jesus equally. So I think there's, there's something of, of importance of, uh, in Jonathan's story and his experience of, of sticking with Jesus all the way, regardless of what audience he's, he's standing in front of. And I find that compelling. This is a question from uh, Lois Mitchell online. And Lois has been with us through the whole time. Thank you for your faithfulness, yeah, yes. She's been engaged. And Glad you're like with you're us here, again. Lois, that's great. She said, in our current political context, I can't help but think that there is moral fusion, immoral fusion, moral confusion, and immoral confusion all operating at the same time. Sure. How are we sure that what we're about is the moral fusion version? Um, well, we're never certain, right? I think uh, an important piece of humility is to recognize that any of us can be wrong about anything. So, um, so when people disagree, I always want to hear them out. Explain it to me. Um, Maybe I'm not seeing something. Um, I think that's important. But then I think it's also important to recognize that um, all of us participate in the communities and the movements and the social institutions that we participate in because of relationships of trust. And... Um, To some degree, you have to make decisions about who you're going to trust. And uh, within my context, because of my experience, much of which I've shared with you by now, um, I've decided that um, I trust people who've had to survive on the bottom. And uh, I'll listen to anybody 
but I listen to those folks to the extent that they're organized and speak with a common voice. I try to listen with a uh, a kind of preferential option. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm uh, I'm willing to say I'm biased. If um, in my town where I live in, if poor and working class black women have decided something matters, um, it probably matters. <laughs> so I'm going to listen to them. <laughs> and in other places, you know, it might be different. But, uh, but I think that Jesus actually uh, pushed me in this direction. When Jesus said um, there at the end of Matthew's gospel that um, uh, I've, tr I've come, I'm paraphrasing here, but I, this is what I think Jesus was saying to the disciples because this is at the end of Jesus' ministry with the disciples and, and Jesus says, you know, I've come to show you God's good way and to live it with you here in the world. And I'm going to continue living it with you. But let me tell you where you're going to see me and hear from me. You're going to hear from me when somebody asks you for something to eat. You're going to hear from me when somebody doesn't have enough to wear and asks you for some clothes. You're going to hear from me when somebody is a stranger and comes to you. And that's, I take that as kind of a promise. Uh, one of my favorite Baptists, a fellow named Clarence Jordan, used to say it like this. Clarence said, um, the resurrection of Jesus doesn't mean <laughs> that uh, Jesus is alive and he's ascended up on high and we get to go and be with him when we die. The resurrection of Jesus means Jesus is alive and he's out here in the world and he's liable to show up at your door any day and bring all of his sick and hungry and imprisoned brothers and sisters with him. That's what the resurrection of Jesus means. <laughs> so I, I kind of lean into that. Now, again, I'll listen to anybody. But um, when, when folks sort of in that situation are speaking with one voice, saying uh, to echo one of the movements I talked about here tonight, when low-wage workers in the United States are saying, we can't survive on 725, that's how they've been saying it for the last decade, because we haven't raised the minimum wage federally in the United States since 2012, so still, still 725 an hour. We can't survive on 725. I believe them. I believe them. And I think that's a moral issue. And that uh, I, I need to figure out how to stand with them in that. Um, yeah. But again, thank you, Lois, for reminding us that we all got to remain humble because you can be wrong about anything. <laughs> my granny, who uh, lived with us when I was growing up, my granny always said, there's two sides to everything, even a piece of bread. Um, <laughs> so I'll hear you out. Hi. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm only asking this question so I didn't. I don't yell at my husband all the way home. Um, in the, I know, right? In the heavenly mindset of always, sort of having a, a view to eternity. I want to understand how you continue to persevere as an admitted. Mm, as being admittedly holding a minority opinion amongst uh, an agenda that is pushed forward and accepted by the majority, I believe, whether it's in seminary or in government or in media, what I've heard today is a, a constant acquiescence to a narrative that has gone unchallenged mm -hmm. in certain atmospheres and it's 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 easy for us in Canada where we can look to our brothers and sisters of the United States as being our you know inferior morally because they've got so many racial issues 
when ours are, they just manifest in other ways mm. in Canada. Mm. And they're just so demonic. Mm. And so I'm trying to understand how you persevere in being a minority opinion holder that is justice-minded, knowing that Jesus is always on the side of the minority oppressed. Well, um, I'll say two things. One is that um, the, the particular form of extremism that I'm trying to resist, I actually don't believe a majority of people subscribe to, although I do think it controls a lot of what actually happens largely because the majority of people are not united in resisting it. So, one of the things that encourages me is that when people do come together and uh, talk about these things, I think most people actually want something better than what we have. Um, and, I believe from history that there are ways that those people can uh, work together in order to change things. So I never believe that change is inevitable, but I believe it's possible. And that keeps me going. It's possible. Because it's possible, I'm going to work for it. But the other side of your question, which is an important one, is uh, how do any of us maintain hope when the evidence of change is not forthcoming? Or, you know, as is sometimes the case, when the evidence uh, is actually contrary to uh, the change that you want. It can seem like sometimes, you know, I mean, I told you this story of how we expanded voting rights in North Carolina, and expanding voting rights actually brought the onslaught of uh, a whole host of organizations that made things worse. Uh, and in that regard, um, I look back often to the voices of this moral fusion movement that I um, uh, outlined for you yesterday. And I think about the people who held on to hope in the face of a uh, a backlash that was overwhelmingly more extreme that would then I think here's one example I'll give you one example this one comes to mind often this is one that my friend Reverend Barber quotes to me often the abolitionist struggle in an organized fashion and in earnest really uh, started in the early 1830s and was consistently building you know, power and organization and membership and people who were committed to abolition. And um, uh, it was uh, about 25 years into that struggle when the people who had organized more and more uh, Americans who agreed that it was wrong to own other people and that therefore they needed to act immediately to abolish the laws that allowed people to own other people. Um, uh, that had grown. And you would think that would be encouraging, right? If you have a movement that's, that, you know, I mean, even in the Northeast, like down in Massachusetts and stuff, when those folks started in the 1830s, they got locked up and run out of town. Uh, I mean, uh, um, they put them in jail in Boston. So... You know, as a Southerner, I have to point out to my Americans and other places sometimes, like, we weren't the only people who were dead wrong on this. Like, y'all, so anyway. Um, <laughs> so by the time you get to the 1850s, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, issued the Dred Scott decision, which in some, in summary, I won't give you the whole history of the case, but in summary, what the decision said was that there were no rights that black people had in the United States that white people had to respect. This is a decision of the highest court in the land, which actually put 
you know, a black person in Philadelphia or New York or anywhere else in a much worse place than they had been in before, right? So this abolition movement had actually created a legal movement and a backlash that resulted in a decision that made things worse for all black people. And when that decision came down, there was a good bit of frustration and depression within certainly the black community, but also within the uh, abolitionist movement. And Frederick Douglass gives this speech at the next abolitionist meeting that he goes to, where he says, um, he, he acknowledges that a lot of people are feeling down. And he says, you know, from one view, this is a terrible thing. But then he says, um, if you take it from the other side, if you take another view, <laughs> he says, uh, I can look back on this movement and I can say that every act of extremism against us has only served to further our agitation and to further expose the lie of the people who are resisting us. He said, so he ends the speech by saying, I'm happy. I'm happy today. This isn't exactly how he said it, but he basically says, I'm happy that the Supreme Court has said something that's so absolutely ridiculous because it's only going to serve to help more people see that we have to abolish slavery. <laughs> Amen. That's a sort of determined hope. That's a determined hope. So uh, as we draw to conclusion tonight, I want to ask one final question that's not historical or public policy, but it is it's personal. Uh, just say a word to us. How does prayer shape and inform this work kind of in your own life, in the life of your intentional community? Uh, how does that fund this work of advocacy and witness? Well, I, you know, I really do believe um, one of the greatest gifts that any of us can be given, um, and I know this is not an experience that everyone has had in their personal lives, but I, I've known a lot of people who've had this experience, and for, for, for everyone who's had this experience, it's an incredible gift to have uh, a parent or some sort of parent figure in your life who looks at you regularly whether you're feeling up or feeling down, and says, I know who you are. Remember who you are. This world will beat you up. It'll throw you down. It'll you know, get you off on the wrong track. Remember who you are. I think, uh, I think deep down, most of us know we need that. Um, and um, I, that's what prayer is for me. I, I really do think that's why Jesus on a human level, why Jesus teaches us to pray, you know, our Father who art in heaven. Um, we, need, we need a relationship with someone who knows who we are and can tell us whatever happens, this is who you are. And if our Creator is willing to uh, converse with us in that way, I think that's an incredible invitation. So um, I'll take it. I'll take it. And um, uh, I've learned that it takes many different forms for people. So, uh, you know, I think you, you, can, uh, you can find your way into that conversation in different ways. But, um, but many, many of you know that uh, the liturgical tradition has been important to me and to our community. And, uh, and so we've, we've prayed in a sort of way that sort of roots us in the story and the psalms and the songs and the scriptures. Um, but also, one of the reasons I sing these songs is that I've learned that, um, that singing is an important form of prayer for me. So uh, even when I'm with nobody else, uh, I keep on singing. And uh, sometimes it bothers my children, but I keep on singing. <laughs> Uh, because it's a form of prayer and a, and a way of being in communion. So, oh, thanks for asking. It's um, it's an invitation, and I'm uh, I'm glad to accept it. Amen. Um, Stuart, if you would come.
So it's uh, my pleasure as the director of the Simpson Lectures to thank people for joining us tonight and joining us for this series of lectures. And if you've joined us here on campus or if you've joined us online, we thank you for being here and making the journey with us. But in particular, Jonathan, I want to thank you for coming. Yeah, please. Someone asked me tonight about what the connection was that caused us to invite you. I couldn't remember properly, uh, but it's a, a decision that, that, that comes and comes to our faculty and we talk about it. I know one or two people in the room uh, had been looking at some of your work and I think that was because of the, that reason that your, your name kind of bubbled to the top. I don't really remember the reason why, but I am so glad we did. So thank you for that, thank you. Because from the beginning, you have been a delight to work with and to deal with from the first email exchanges as we worked our way then through Canadian taxation systems and all of that kind of stuff. You, you have done it with such good grace, which makes a huge difference uh, when you're working with people. Yesterday, and you, you wouldn't have heard her, but. Uh, one of our contributors here spoke about the fact, res reflecting on traditional rhetoric back to Aristotle, that in order to be persuasive, you needed to convince on three levels. And she used you as an example, actually. But the three levels she spoke about were ethos, character, pathos, emotion, and then logos is reason. And I would say that you have operated wonderfully in all of those levels and integrated it into your talk. So again, we thank you for coming and being yourself and being with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> now we've got a couple of things to say, but I'll hand over to the boss. Have you had a good time this week? <laughs> I'm glad. It's an amazing thing. Look, I don't even have a voice left. <laughs> Stuart said earlier, do you, did you ever have a voice? But um, um, that's, why, that's why I love this team. We can be really real together. Um, but uh, I, this has been a, a very exciting week for all of us. It's been exciting for me because uh, the idea started many, many years ago as a fragment or a spark of an idea. And uh, that it's been made a reality is amazing, uh, but it would never have been able to happen without the commitment of this team. And this is an amazing team. I've heard people say to me this week, what an incredible team you have at Acadia Divinity College. I said, I know, every day, I know. And so I have some thanks to give um, <clears throat> to the whole team. I would say that I'm emotional, but I'm not, <laughs> certainly I don't know what's up with my voice. Um, <clears throat> that's not to say I wouldn't be emotional, but anyway. Uh, ethos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just keep going. Um, so I want to thank everyone who came this week and embraced the vision uh, because you caught it and that means that we will be able to do it next year. That's Lord willing. This is, so book this week now, save the week. I want to thank all of you who were here, man, the effort to be here in person, participate so fully this week. We had about an equal sized audience online as we had in the room. And so that's really exciting too. We're grateful to those of you who registered and uh, participated online. <clears throat> But the staff have been fully committed to making this a reality. I, we, we've had meetings, a lot of meetings. And we just, some of those meetings are just to say, okay, let's run through the whole week, the whole program. Let's see what goes next and what goes next and what goes next. So if you've experienced a smooth program, it's because of that hard work. And they've been fully committed to making this a reality. Stuart, thank you for taking the lead, not only in renewing the Simpson Lectures, but in this way that allows us to grow the idea of a summer school. And I really deeply appreciate that. Thank you for all your work in making this happen. Danny, for being ever present, willing to serve and lead, whatever's needed. Appreciate you so much, Danny. I'm grateful to the faculty who presented this week. There were several, I'm not gonna name everybody because we'll go on all night, but thank you, you know who you are and we know who you are. Our admin staff went the extra mile. And so Carly, excellent media. She was just on it all week, smiling, leading a worship. Um, so grateful. Carly's on the road back to New Brunswick. We're praying for her safety as she drives. Um, Shauna for the kitchen party. What a fun time we had. So glad. Yeah. 
Evelyn, you kept me on track all week as usual. Thank you. So important. Uh, Suzanne, always with a smile, whatever needs to be done. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Andrea Pierce, she was just there selling stuff to you, <laughs> taking your money. Um, but yes, we're grateful to that too, for her too. Ben, for being a, a, just a presence here. I think we've recruited several people this week. So we're really pleased about that and uh, really glad that you're part of the team, Ben. Um, we have an alum, John Scarpuzzi on the cameras. Thanks, John, appreciate you. Um, our current student, Luke Steves, the one and only amazing Luke Steves, whom we love very much. Yeah. But I will say, I hope I didn't miss anybody, because like, that's terrible. Um, everybody worked hard. What are you, <laughs> the people flagging at me, you know exactly who I miss. <laughs> gotcha. Um, there are two people who went over and above in every single way this week. And so I'm going to ask Tricia, would you come forward, please? <laughs> Every single time we had a break or a snack or a meal or something that went on, Tricia organized that. She put it together and she made it happen. Tricia, we love you very much. <laughs> and John Campbell, would you come forward? <laughs> John is our Director of Advancement, as you know, so he worked hard to put together a number of the events here. But we are the strength of the college that we are because our tech is just so amazing. So not only a Director of Advancement, but he's a, just, I think, an absolute genius with our tech, enables our message to go out there and to be out there. And John, we love you and appreciate you. Thank you. John, John's rushing back to the computer. It's great. Thanks, John. Uh, so, so just to say, uh, can we put up the dates? This will, so we want to announce next year's speaker at the Simpson Lectures will be Otis Moss the uh, third. For for some people who have heard him in the the preaching class that I've done, uh, I'm sure you'll already be very excited about that. We don't have a theme up as yet. It will be something around the the area of preaching, but we haven't really agreed that uh, all of the detail with that. So. I think again, we, we, are, we will continue to look at how we, did, we design the particular week. There will be some variety in that, but I think already in discussion, if you can, if you can pull this off, it may be that we'll switch one night which, and have the lecture during the day and the evening will be a worship service where simply we, we let him come and preach and bring in a band and all that kind of thing. So we're looking forward to that. So we, we hope that you'll be with us on these dates next year, which will then be the second of our East Coast Theology Summer School. So thanks very much for joining us this week, and thanks to everybody, and Anna, as ever, for her support and the leadership of the team, because you may have noticed she's been here all the time as well. Thank you.